Hello everyone, this is Joe Dolezal with Raw Magic The Show. Today's topic, we're going to talk about time and the concept of time. Now, from a scriptural perspective, time is a very interesting idea because it is exactly that, an idea. It's an illusion in point in fact. In the Yoga Sutras, they talk about time as actually being an illusion and it's a bifurcation of consciousness as such because we as the individual perceive time as something outside of us. Um, if we are standing in a local position and we look at an object, let's say 10, 20, 30 feet away, and we want to walk to that object, then we say it's going to take us 5 seconds, it's going to take us 10 seconds or 15 seconds to walk to that object, but there's basically an A-B correlation. And that is what gives our mind uh, the illusion or the perception of time. Now, what's interesting again is that time really is an illusion. It's a perception of the mind because there really is no such thing as walking to an object because you have to ask yourself, when do you as a, as a person or as a mind or as a sense or as a conscious entity really come in contact with that particular object? And if we try to deduce and analyze that, you never really come in contact with an object. You really don't, because even as quantum physics says, we, you never touch an anything. When you think you touch a table, you're actually coming in contact with the, electro, the electrons in that particular object. And there is, there is in point in fact, a distance or a lacuna um, between you as the, as, the, as the person and that object that you think you're coming in communion contact with. And this is actually why we, throughout our lives, we constantly search for sense, sense titillation and coming in contact with objects because if reaching an object of our desire led us to happiness or anything, then we would just have to go through that process once and essentially we would be spiritually satiated. And of course, none of us are. We're always moving towards more and more objects throughout the course of our life. So that idea puts the concept of time into some perception or into some perspective that time really is an illusion because if you can if you can percept if you can perceive yourself as an object not so much as a human being but rather that you're in a ball a big bubble and the big bubble will really be the universe for this example but we'll just say you're in a t certain bubble and you're not so much moving as such but you're just you're just moving your certain resonations to come in contact with a particular object that your mind later perceives as coming in contact with now in the dream state we know that we could be not moving physically anywhere at all and sometimes we could come out of a dream state more satiated, more fulfilled with coming in contact with an ideal or an object that we otherwise don't want in the waking state. But this is an interesting, um, this is an interesting concept really to cover in, in the concept of time because if you are sleeping and you come out of a dream state and you feel more satiated in that dream state than you would in the waking state, if, for a moment at least, then it goes to show that that time is again an illusion because how could you become so satiated in that particular dream state until you realize it was a dream but before you woke up out of that dream you were much more satisfied than you would potentially even be in a waking state so it just goes to show that what really time is is its consciousness moving in certain directions and coming in communion with perceptions or ideals that are quote unquote outside of that of that conscious entity so really what consciousness is based on that is not so much, it's not so much a space-time thing, but what it is, is it's consciousness falling back in on itself and not bifurcating in the sense that it's moving outwards and seeing something out there. Because if you can look not so much outside but inwardly and see that those things that you see outside are not really outside but within you, as you see with the dream example, that it's something happening within you and not physically, then you can actually bypass that whole transition of time and you really do become eternal in the sense of the scriptures that you're no longer in the fourth dimension, as they say, because we have space, we have the, the depth, the width, and the height, which, and then Einstein said that there was a fourth dimension, which was this time, but if you can bypass that, then you're no longer in the time, and you become something supernal to the, the time aspect, because your consciousness becomes in communion one with whatever it is that your mind sees, quote-unquote, outside of its own consciousness. So again, to recap, that time so much, it doesn't exist, it's a perception it's a mental perception, and the one, one thing that we know about it for sure is, again, if you sleep and you come in contact with something, and that when you become in contact with it, your consciousness is satiated and happy, at least for a moment until you come out of the dream, that conclusively shows that space-time is not really a real thing. It's, it's totally in the head. It's a perception of such. And so that's what, that's what time is from a, briefly, that's the concept of time from a scriptural perspective. 
So let me ask you with this time thing. Basically what you're saying in essence is time isn't the cycles and experiencing the life and giving a frame of existence to life. Time is actually the term that's used to define the tool to measure these cycles, right? That's what it was created for. Not so much giving something so much power that it actually controls the existence, you know, that it's counted down or, or it has its exact cycles, but time is a tool used, you know, used to explain things. That's what I think it is, but instead, people are misled to believe that time has this strong hold that it in itself is a like, you know, do you get what I'm getting at? And it does, and I understand what you're saying. The the idea of time definitely has its own reality, and I think most of us live in the reality of time, even though that's not the ultimate reality, and I think it is it is subject and inferior to higher realities within within our um, conscious abilities, then we most definitely, most of us live in that reality, because remember, time it is, time is basically the byproduct of seeing of being a see, a seer, and the seen. It's basically, and that's what our senses are constantly galvanizing or moving towards. Our senses want to see things, they want to feel things, they want to touch things, they want to smell things. And because of this really overemphasized conscious state of sense titillation that we are in, you know, particularly in the Kali Yuga or the Dark Ages, as even the Bible says, we're in the end times, um, so to speak, then there's a much more emphasized process on the senses always constantly trying to move outwards and trying to feel things, trying to see things. And because of that, we have a much more conscious awareness, a conscious appreciation or conscious awareness of time because of the fact that the senses, the sense, the, the way the senses actually maneuver is through space and time. A minus space time, senses actually have no ability to do what they do. And this is why it's extremely important to to meditate because it reverts that cycle and it, it starts collecting the consciousness that otherwise would be channeled into the senses. So you're absolutely right. There is a reality to the the cyclical maneuvers of time as such, but again, it is only a fractional reality and it's not the reality as such. It's basically, it's a unit to measure certain things, but it's by no means the ultimate reality. See, I like that. But And here's another interesting example I'll give that I had a personal, like, experience and I've told you about it before. I had a dream once. This dream I experienced the entire day, minute by minute, hour by hour. I woke up, took a shower, um, went, you know, did my hike, I did work that I needed to do work that day. I mean everything you can imagine. I experienced it all like it was an extremely vivid dream. Twelve hours of the day, everything up until going to bed. All of this I remembered vividly from the dream and I experienced it like I felt it, like I was excited and everything. And all of this happened within probably, I can't tell you the exact time, but all of this experience that I had happened, it was either in 5 seconds or 30 seconds. Because it was from the time I heard a beeping noise from my smoke alarm, beeping to slowly waking me up, to my actual alarm on my phone waking me up. So within that time, because I slowly started getting conscious, that's how I, that's how I know, because I remember the beep, then I remember the entire day I experienced, and then I woke up. And I, when I woke up right away, I was like, oh my God, like, I, I felt like I had an entire day just happen within my mind. Right. And it was so interesting. So those entire 12 hours of being awake happened in seconds. Seconds. And it was lived, and it was felt. And that's the important part. It felt like I experienced every single hour. It wasn't just boom, 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 like segmented memories. Right. It was like a fulfilled day. qualitative experience altogether. You're right. And this is, you know, it goes back to, to ossifying the idea of time being an illusion because, again, you know, a lot of times when we're here, one hour can feel like drudgery if we're doing something that we inherently don't like to do. But if we're doing something that's extremely pleasant to us, time goes by a lot faster. The illusion of time goes by a lot faster. And also when you go to sleep, you can be out for 6, 8, 12 hours. And, you know, from the, the mental perception, it could be literally a blink of an eye. Another idea, you know, that, that you were um, touching up on in that is that when people die, they have their you know, entire life flashes before they, uh, their eyes, as they say. And this is, again, you know, you can have all these experiences in a matter of seconds that would otherwise have taken years. And that's based on the fact that the consciousness, it pulls together much more tightly. And we feel this if we feel like we're going to get in an accident or we feel afraid or we feel like we're going to die. This... Um, 
this heightening of everything being sensed within us, this heightened conscious awareness is what it is, is that the consciousness, it reverts back, it pulls back, which is what meditation inherently is, but it also can be artificially induced if you feel like you're going to get in a car accident, and time just totally slows down. Sometimes you could literally, you can slow two seconds down to five minutes, and we've all been there. A dream. And, and that's what that is, is that your consciousness, instead of being reverted out, then it reverts back in on itself, and then you become much more aware of even a second, and you can see everything around you. And this is what happens to people in near death experiences. But it goes later to to elucidate the idea that time is really it's a, it's a, it's an illusion. It's not real. It's what your mind is feeling. Some people can be on drugs, and you know, one minute can go by in one second, and then sometimes you know, in three seconds, so you you see basically the alterations in time consciousness. Doesn't that though? change everything if we think about this. Time, all time is now. Mm -hmm. The past was now. All it of is. the past. The future is all now. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that just completely take away free will? It, it does and it doesn't again. Um, in the scriptures, in the, yoga, in the Yoga Sutra scriptures, what I like about that is that they say that exactly, that if we further elaborate on that, time as such not only doesn't exist because it is a mental perception, but what they say is that your body is a is a vessel. It's a, it's an entity that took manifestation in this particular time because or this particular period in conscious development because the the environment is conducive to experiences that your karma, your mind, your conscious soul would be able to exhaust in these particular environment in this particular environment. And you're right that there's the past really doesn't exist because if you think about even now, what is now? What is that? You can't define it. We can say that it is an agglomeration of senses, of feelings, of um, agreements, potentialities. Some, we know there's something we still want to do in the future, so this particular environment is not conducive to all, our, uh, all of our potentials that we would want to exhaust. And also that, that, that goes into the context of the past. Basically, what is even the past when you think about it? I think we've all been there where we've had a great experience in the past and we wanted to relive that. So maybe we put ourselves in a self trance, and for a moment we were there, you know, in the past, re experiencing those things as if they were real, sometimes more real. And this can also be, this can also be correlated to huge pains that people have had in their life. Sometimes when you close your eyes, maybe you're semi asleep, you can go through those same exact experiences. And we'll come up on this topic after the break. Um, because I think we can elaborate a lot more into this and, and explain the ideal of time. So again, this is Joe Dolezal. We're going to come back from our break, and this is Raw Magic, the show. Welcome back, everyone. This is Joe Dolezal with Raw Magic, the show. And before we continue on what we were talking about in context of the illusion of time and time as a conception, we had a question from uh, our guest audience, and so why don't you go ahead and ask that question that you had. Well, we just discussed how everything is the now but at the same time we couldn't define now because the minute you try to look at that, the minute we try to define time now we're already describing the past exactly you're right because <laughs> and, and that's what's ironic about everything of the sense titillations in time is when we try to when we try to describe the now then all we're basically doing all we're basically doing is we are recapping on what just happened immediately, a millimeter, uh, a millisecond ago or a second ago, and we really can never define the now because, in point of fact, the now it, it it's it's again it's part of that illusion. It's not the full illusion, but it's part of the illusion. Now, I'm going to recap on what we talked about, which does actually cover the question from the audience member, and that was that that the past, present, and the future all they basically are is they are points, if you want to even look at that, but they're not really that. They are just environments that are conducive to the experiences a particular conscious entity would want to go through. So in other words, is you have a conscious entity within an environment, and within that environment, the conscious entity can experience what it wants to experience, and, and through that process of conscious evolution, there is a, a, what we would deem a past, what we would deem a now and what we would deem a future. And so that's really what the idea of past, present, and future are because there really is no such thing as now. There's just something that we're experiencing as conscious entities. So, let me ask you this. Um, damn, I freaking skittles in my mouth. It sounds so, ugh, sorry about that. But let me ask you this. I have a little interesting question. So if you fully understand what time is, if you fully get the concept and you understand, your body begins to understand the cycles, um, can you manipulate time? Can you make, you know, can you control time? Can you slow down your life cycle sure. to where it would extend longer? And is there any evidence of this? 
Well, there is, and, and you know, that's a two-part question and requires a two-part answer. First of all, there is an ability, a way to control time, and that is the way you control anything in this world, whether it's physical or spiritual or mental, is you have to rise, your consciousness has to rise above it, and that is rise above the concept of, of time, which would inherently mean you have to understand what time is, and that goes into what we were recapping earlier, that it's not so much a now, it's not so much that something happened a minute ago or a year ago, but rather that you are a particular being, unnamed, unformed, and it's going through a process, a reactive process in its environment so that it may become consciously refined and exhaust a particularity um, that is the body form so that it could sublimate into a larger whole. So if you start thinking times in these abstract notions, which I understand are extremely abstract, then you can start placing yourself above the idea of time because life itself becomes extremely impersonal, even though you're still in the person, even though you're still in the being, but your consciousness doesn't wholly reside in you anymore, as it were, but it really does start sublimating and rising above the quote-unquote time concept. And so if one can do that, sure, naturally, one becomes timeless and immortal. And this is what they say in all the scriptures, whether they're religious Eastern scriptures or the Yoga Sutras, or, um, you know, when they talk about you being immortal, then I'm of the opinion that what they're talking about is your consciousness rising above not only the elements, but also the concept of space-time and residing consciousness looping in by itself, as it were, and you becoming that God potential because you are beyond those concepts of time, beyond phenomenality, as it were. And so if you place yourself into that particular realm, then naturally you'd be able to control it just like anything. When you understand something, that does inherently give you the ability to control it more or less. Do you think people are so, so anal retentive about the word time because it's a scientific term and they lose sight of the, the spiritual aspects of what time is and what it can pose? Well, I think, you know, there's, for, for the most part, most people have no need to really get into the abstract notions of time unless you're inherently spiritual because one would need to take their conscious journey in that direction. And for the most part, you know, the, our ideal and notion of time being linear, it does serve a purpose in a scientific perspective, even though time isn't, one, it's, it's an illusion. But if we have to dub it real, then it's more cyclical than it is linear, as most of us think. And today, right now, it's one, then it's two, tomorrow's another day, tomorrow's another day. Because if you look at the planets, if you look at our lives, if you look at the lives of anything, um, anything that comes into existence, it has a birth, and it has, a, it has some kind of a life, and then it has a diminution, and then, then it later transmutates into something else, whether it's an organic or an organic object. So, you know, this whole business of the physical universe is cyclical and not linear. Um, you know, and there's, there's many people that have variegated opinions and, and understandings of the abstraction of time, but I think it's, it's a question of what are you looking for. If you want to be a, um, you know, if you want to be a, a Newtonian physicist, then the idea of linear time would probably serve you well if you wanted to rise above that and perhaps get more involved in the psychic powers and psychic development or understand God, as it were, then you should probably abandon that notion and go more towards the abstraction where you rise above it and really become an immortal, timeless soul, as the scriptures indicate. So then, in essence, do you think if you eliminated time or that concept of time in your mind, you're, you could illuminate your, your spirituality quicker or even instantaneously? Well, I think, I think by eliminating it would inherently, it's like a teeter-totter, you wouldn't necessarily have one or the other or avoid, as it were, but you would rather have the more heightened and rising above the idea of time would inherently illuminate your consciousness more and more because remember, um, as was covered in the very beginning, what time is, and I know I've said this already, but I'm going to recap because it is relevant to your question, what time is, is, is it's an externalization of your senses. Um, that there, in, in the sutras or in the, in the scriptures, they basically say you have your senses, which is you see, you smell, you taste, you touch, you hear, and the mind is basically the central processing unit or the, the main component that decides whether a sense is apparently good or bad. We know good and bad don't really exist, but the mind is the ultimate di dictum, whether this, this sense interaction is good or bad, and then that ultimately resides within the heart as, as karma, as it were. But this, gets, uh, this is not relevant for this particular discussion. The point is, is that the illusion of time is um, interaction between the senses and the object as such. So if you wanted to refine that, basically through the meditative process or collecting those quote-unquote rays that um, the consciousness externalizes itself through the senses, that would naturally put you in a position that is uh, superior to the time concept and the, and, the time, and the time ideal because meditation is inherently not interested in time. 
it's interested in collecting the consciousness and amplifying that light to a certain point that you break past the illusion of phenomenal existence. So it's, it comes one, one with the other. It's not so much, you know, it's like, um, um, it's like if you die, then your body's going to naturally decompose. You don't really die and preserve the body, even though some people try to do that. It's, it's, you're essentially saying the one and the same thing. When one does truly illuminate themselves, they do more or less become, or their consciousness um, is past that um, space-time concept or that space-time um, conception which is inherently in the mind. During the first segment when you were talking about time and how we don't really move towards an object and we, we, right. we experience things, when we look at them we, we believe they're outside of us and truly our consciousness, everything is within us. Right. That sounds a lot like like law of attraction to me. Is that more or less? Uh, more or less. It, uh, what I would say it's not so much the law of attraction; it's the science behind the law of attraction. Because exactly that's it. You know, we've discovered that consciousness has different states. If we were all asleep and we never woke up, we would not even be aware of this reality of the waking state. And we know we've all had good dreams. We've all had bad dreams. And sometimes in the good dreams, we can acquire things that truly in the dream will make us extremely happy, it will make us feel complete, we'll feel sometimes even joy and emotions we don't feel in this state, and it's not until we come out of it we can say, oh wow, that wasn't real. Well, what the scriptures say is this reality isn't even real, that there's more qualitative existences. And so, yeah, it's basically the science behind the law of attraction, because again, scientifically, Science will even tell you, whether it's Newtonian or modern physics, that we never really come in contact with anything. But this is also what the Tantra, the, the Tantra said back thousands of years ago, that everything is just a vibrations, and you don't really ever touch anything. What happens is the electrons, they create a magnetic repulsion or in any atom. So when you're touching a piece of wood and you're holding that piece of wood, what happens on a molecular scale is that the electrons create a magnetic repulsion against your fingers, and that's what we, quote-unquote, feel as something. But see, you're, you never actually touch the atom of anything. Never. None of us have ever touched the atom of anything, whether it's a table, an object, glass, wood, another person. What we're actually feeling is the electromagnetic repulsion of all those millions of atoms when we come into contact with something. And so again, what is contact? When you think, it really is just the experience as such that we think we're having in the phenomenal day-to-day -day world, it's an illusion. First of all, it doesn't really happen molecularly, scientifically, not only spiritually, but scientifically, the experience is we don't ever touch anything, we don't ever taste anything, but we have the perception of touching things, of feeling things, of seeing things. And this is why perceptions always in human history are variegated, because none of it's real. When we look at this phone, or when we look at a bottle, or when we look at a human being, we're all going to have slightly different perceptions about it. Why? Because our perception isn't the truth. It's not based in anything. Somebody will like this person, and one of us will hate that person, and we'll all have our own reasons that, according to our philosophies, will be the absolute truth. But see, that's not the truth of thing, because if it were, then we wouldn't, nobody would variegate in their opinions. But the point is, is that all these experiences are actually happening here. They're not happening out there, but sometimes we need to be out there to facilitate certain reactions within the mind that later go over into the heart and makes us feel either satisfied or angry, that we say, ah, that was it. But see, it's an illusion. And they even say this in the scriptures, they made a really good quote that I, I love quoting all the time. And it just says that life is nothing but a dream and you are nothing but a thought. Thought in the, in the universal mind. And I absolutely love that quote because it, you know, it really is, life is truly a dream when you think about it. You know, we went through so many things in our lives that were extremely pleasant to us that have no meaning and we can't even remember. And some things that were painful that, you know, at one point we could have killed somebody for them. And, it, you know, we vaguely even remember it sometimes. So it's like, when, when does anything in life, when you start deducing it in that respect, really become truth? And it doesn't. Because what it is, is you have to go beyond that to understand what's happening. You have to go to the science of life, as it were, which is this whole process of meditation. Um, to understand what's actually happening because when you're out there living life there's something happening but it's not what you think it is and this is again like we've touched up on earlier why nobody's happy in life you find a, a mate you like them then you don't like them then you just stay with them for emotional reasons or you make money you're happy then it goes back to normal like as if you never made the money well if our ideals when realized were the truth as we believe they are today and as we believe they were in the past and we would have never we would never need to move anywhere anymore but all of us are constantly restless every day I need to go out again today, I need to go do the cycle over, maybe I'll change it a little bit. And that shows that phenomenal existence as such 
doesn't have substantial reality. And what's important is to understand that science, that conscious science of what's happening internally with us in order to find true saturation and true happiness and ultimately truth. So again, to answer your question, it is. When we talk about, when we talk about uh, the secret, the secret isn't so much, it, it's not so much about as you think if you become, yes, but no. It's about feeling, it's about feeling certain things and then moving, shaking this physical existence so that it may resonate with that thing which is deeply in your heart. And it's a totally impersonal phenomenon. And this is, one of the, this is one of the reasons why I'm against vision boards, because when you're envisioning something from your perspective, the point, the, the reality is you don't have the truth of that because you haven't experienced it yet. So what you have to do is you have to just kind of keep your heart in a certain place, open it up, drop your preconceived notions, because it's your preconceived notions that actually block you from moving forward, and then just keep moving until you resonate with that pattern. And on that note, we are going to take a short break. And no, actually, we're going to recap on this particular subject in our next episode. And again, this is uh, Joseph Dolezal, and this is Raw Magic, the show. We'll recap on this subject on our next episode.